Welcome to Yahoo Finance Live. I'm Julie Hyman. That's Josh Lipton. Here we are at the New York Stock Exchange. And here's what you need to know as of 3 p.m. Eastern. Birkenstock finally opened for trading in the last hour or so, sinking from its $46 IPO price to open at 41. What's behind the move and what that says about the state of business, the consumer and competition in that industry. And Exxon Mobil striking a nearly $60 billion deal to buy shale giant Pioneer Natural Resources. This is the biggest energy deal in two decades and will make Exxon the largest producer in America's biggest oil field. Let's check out the stocks right now. You can see Exxon down more than 4% while Pioneer is popping about 1%. We're going to get an analyst reaction and what it means for the rest of the sector. And finally, on Capitol Hill, House Republicans are closer to selecting the next House Speaker. Congressman Steve Scalise is the nominee, but it may not be smooth sailing to get the votes needed to secure the job. We'll be following the latest developments out of Washington. All right, so now let's get you up to speed on the market action here. We've got a mixed picture now for stocks. We've seen a little bit of bouncing around in today's session. Right now, the Dow is lower by 12 points. Not even a tenth of 1%. The S&P up about a tenth of 1%. The Nasdaq gaining four tenths of 1%. Um, again, it is a tale of Treasuries kind of driving the bus here today. We have continued declines in Treasury yields on the session. And that means we have a continuing recovery in some of the interest rate sensitive groups, real estate and utilities, for example, are leading stocks today as we see the 10-year yield pull, pull back by another six basis points to 4.6%. In the meantime, we've got oil still under pressure and energy stocks sliding today, Josh. That's it. So let's break down some of what's moving the markets here today. One is, Julie, let's start with these inflation numbers. September PPI, so producer price index, rose 0.5%. That was warmer than expected, though core, so excluding those volatile food and energy categories, that rose just 0.2%. So that was the same as in August. Of course, CPI, the consumer price index, the big one, that's coming tomorrow. That's the one we're going to be focused on, looking for an increase of 0.3% from the previous month and 3.6% year over year. Of course, we pay close attention to that as we look for any kind of clues we can get about the Fed's rate hiking campaign. We do, and it's really interesting. The CPI comes at a very interesting moment here we've been hearing from a lot of Federal Reserve officials, including more over the past so much, few days. So much talking. So much talking. Wow. And the consensus seems to be building toward there not being an interest rate increase at the November meeting. That's what interest rate futures are reflecting. This, even though we got Federal Reserve minutes today, the minutes from the last meeting mm. that was September 19th and 20th, that seems like a very long time ago. And effectively, the minutes from that meeting seem to indicate a little more hawkishness, that the Fed would be a little more restrictive, maybe would raise rates one more time. So it's just an interesting reminder of how much the perception has changed on the part of the market, on the part seemingly with the Fed itself. It all comes back to what Treasury yields have been doing. That is mostly going higher, although they've been pulling back over the past couple of days, sort of doing the work of the Fed. And so all of that, meaning maybe we won't get that interest rate increase. Yeah, you, know, you bring up a good November. point because you look at those Fed minutes and here's the key phrase. A majority of participants judge that one more increase right. in the target federal funds rate at a future meeting would likely be appropriate. But as you know, this is backward looking. We don't know if that still holds. Right. Nope. And it seems like the market says it probably does not. Nope. Nope. Yeah. Moving on, Birkenstock finally opening for trading here. And so far, not a good start for the footwear company. Jared Blickery here with a closer look. Jared. Hi there, Josh. Uh, no, this is, let's go to Wi-Fi Interactive and I can plot the action. It took until 1.30 p.m. for this stock to open today. And uh, I don't want to say it was a disaster, but it was not good. Uh, IPOing yesterday at $46 per share. And you can see this on the screen. There's $46. It opened up at 41. So way down here. And it's trading lower than that, trading at $40.63. Interesting stat from Bloomberg um, of the more than 300 IPOs that have raised more than a billion dollars this side of the year 2000. Guess what? Only, I think, 11 have fared worse. You'd have to go all the way back to 2021, app loving, to see a stock that came in this percentage uh, below its IPO price. And in this case, it was 11% below its $46 IPO price. 
personally, I don't remember a stock ever opening uh, this late in the day. And I think it just had to do with uh, some consternation over this lower price. And in fact, saying, what does this mean for the markets? Because after last year, the uh, capital markets kind of dried up for new issues. We didn't see that many until relatively recently. I can go down the list here. Here's Instacart. And let me put a max chart on so we can plot the action, the price action. You can see Instacart down 16%. Arm Holdings, one of the biggest IPOs in years, uh, that's down 7%. Kava Group down 15%. Savers Value Village, similar. Uh, only Kodiak Gas Services, that's an oil and gas offering uh, different dynamics there. That is still in the green. But, you know, Birkenstock also interesting because this is one of the oldest, or it was one of the oldest private companies, and now it is public. 249 years it's spent in the private markets, uh, second only to Goldman Sachs. You can see that was that took 130 years before it became public. American Express on there, Johnson & Johnson and Campbell's. Um, all of this is to say, what does this mean? I think traders are trying to scratch their head and say, what does this mean for the capital markets going forward? I think the next IPO going to be uh, receiving a little bit of hesitation and even maybe some more deliberation by the market makers that have to open up uh, that stock. And I don't envy them after what happened here today with Birkenstock. Jared Blickery, thank you, sir. Birkenstock making its public debut on the New York Stock Exchange, the company opening at $41 a share. It's after pricing its IPO, remember, at $46 per share. Birkenstock's market debut coming nearly 250 years since its inception. Shares, though, tumbling here on its first day of trading. Now, here to discuss this latest test for the IPO market, we have Pauline Brown, former LVMH chairman of North America. So, Pauline, let me start with, with Birkenstock, kind of a, a bumpy debut here. What do you make of Birkenstock and, and at least the initial public market reaction? Well, I think the reaction is more a reflection of the pricing than it is the quality of the stock. Uh, on the one hand, this is a blockbuster deal for its uh, its owners, El Caterton, the Arnaud Group, uh, a few others. Uh, they just bought it a little over two years ago at um, uh, a price uh, that is about half of the valuation that it is today, even on the 10% drop. So on the one hand, I say my hat's off to them. In two years, to have that kind of appreciation uh, is pretty astounding. On the other hand, I say they were too greedy in coming out at 46 a share. I mean, that is a valuation that, from a multiple basis, is closer to Nike than it is to Adidas. And it is way in excess of Adidas as a multiple of uh, EBITDA. So I think it was uh, it was too aggressive and a bit reckless. Uh, Pauline, um, let's talk about Bergenstock as a company, right, and as a product. Um, and as someone who was in that world, um, what obviously Bergenstock already has had a lot of staying power, and even in its modern inter iteration, has managed to have a lot of staying power. How does that evolve as a public company? Does it? sort of will it rise to the demands of being a public company in terms of sales and in terms of still appealing to customers? Well, um, first of all, I would I would argue that I'm not sure the staying power is quite as you just characterized. For the first 250 years of its existence, it went from zero to about $300 million in sales. It was only in the last decade that it went from around $300 million to around $1.3 billion in fiscal 22. So the run up in a very short slice of time relative to its long history is, uh, it says to me that this is a fashion play. Uh, this is not a company that is selling on its functionality. Its functionality was, was there for two and a half centuries in terms of it being a well produced uh, shoe, one that historically targeted hippies and uh, those in need of ortho orthopedic support. Uh, nowadays, if you look at who's buying it, it is uh, more akin to sneakerheads and fashionistas. Um, so a lot of the newer growth uh, is built up on um, a more modern day branding. And that will be tested as to whether that's sustainable. That is a much harder uh, audience to sustain or to um, build on than the original audience of orthopedic and, uh, and hippies who uh, were living with it for a good generation. Well, Paulina, I'm not a sneakerhead, and my wife would tell you I'm definitely not a fashionista, but I own two pairs of Birkenstocks. Let me ask you this, though. Um, do you think it's possible that LVM 
H's results, which disappointed some investors. Do you think maybe that could be weighing a bit here on investor demand for a consumer facing brand like Birkenstock? Uh, for sure. Um, and, and not because this is a luxury brand in the same way that most of LVMH's brands are, uh, but it is premium priced. And in fact, if you look at the growth uh, in the last few years under new ownership, a good part of that growth was uh, through price inflation. The price per, uh, per pair is quite a bit higher than it was uh, historically. Um, and part of that is because they are going for more of a fashion forward segment. They've been doing uh, doing collaborations with Rick Owens, with Phoebe Philo, uh, with Valentino, uh, with several other brands, and they've done it to great fanfare. But uh, that does put it in a category of stock that is much more vulnerable in the environment we're in than the, uh, the original basic footwear that they were playing in. Well, and Josh brought up LVMH. Of course, you're a veteran of that company. And um, we got their results as well. That stock has been under pressure. And I think kind of the theme I got from the LVM LVMH results was normalization. In other words, that it had seen sort of uneven demand, but more recently a spike in demand for luxury. It seems like now that's sort of coming back to earth. So what's, what is a normal level of growth for the luxury sector? What should investors expect? Yeah. Well, when I look at the five subsectors of LVMH, and one of them is up over 20 percent, and the other one is down about 15 percent, I don't think of that as normalizing in either case. Um, I think it was a very mixed bag. I think that there were a few large brands within the LVMH portfolio that served as a heavy anchor. Uh, Hennessy Cognac, which is about 50 percent of their wine and spirits division, uh, was probably the heaviest anchor. I think Tiffany is growing uh, much slower than was expected and uh, obviously at great expense because it was by far the biggest acquisition the company ever did. Uh, the fashion portfolio, Vuitton, Dior, several others like Celine, uh, that actually did okay. Uh, it's not doing nearly what it was just a year ago this time. It's not even doing in growth what it was one or two quarters ago. So I, I would say with fashion and accessories, there is a so-called normalizing. I think the others, uh, there are some much more fundamental challenges that are taking it out of a normal zone of uh, contraction. Uh, and Pauline, final question, I want to circle it back around to Birkenstock. Is there a price at which it would be attractive, where you do think that investors should get in here? And is that price where it is now, or is it 20% below here, for example? Well, I haven't done the math to say exactly where it should be priced, uh, and I'm not an investor, and I wouldn't be an investor um, simply because of the risk variables we've talked about. But what I would say, if you are going to get in, um, now or any time in the future, what you need to be betting on is, number one, uh, that this is a brand that will resonate in Asia. Right now, about 90 percent of the sales are in uh, Europe and the Americas. Uh, so if it doesn't grow uh, pretty um, robustly in other markets, especially Asia, it probably will be saturated in its core markets pretty quickly if it's not already. Uh, number two, uh, and I know we have a uh, an Uggswear uh, uh, on, the, on the crew here, uh, men are not a very strong segment. In fact, about 75% of the customer base are women. And so if this is not a brand that will transcend and will continue to appeal to men as it has for women. Uh, that'll be another natural limitation. Uh, number three, you know, if you're in the trend business and the trends for many years were around sneakers and now they're shifting to sort of other forms of comfort wear like Uggs, and, uh, and, and Birkenstock, is, is that sustainable? Or uh, will people move on to maybe more formal wear as they have with uh, ready-to-wear? Uh, I'm not saying every, anyone uh, in this post-COVID era is going to go back to stilettos. I think those days may be over, uh, at least for daytime. But I do think there's probably something in between uh, those walking pillows and uh, maybe the more elegant look that, uh, that we were accustomed to, particularly in, in the workplace. Pauline Brown, thank you so much for your time, that insight. That was great. Thank you. Thank you. Good to see you. We are watching shares of Goldman Sachs right now. The bank warning of a hit to third quarter earnings as a result of the sale of Green Sky. It's a fintech platform. It comes ahead of Goldman's earnings report next week. So specifically, Julie, this is going to result in a 19 cents per share impact to third quarter earnings. You know, you listen to CEO David Solomon. We know there's been this shift 
in how he's thinking about consumer finance. The key line here to me was from Solomon, this transaction demonstrates our continued progress in narrowing the focus of our consumer business. So getting back here to their bread and butter, it's trading, it's iBanking, it's wealth management. Right, really interesting here. And this was a very quick turnaround for Green Sky, by the way. The company agreed to buy it in 2021 for two and a quarter billion dollars. Then by the time it had completed the transaction last year, that fall that price had fallen to $1.7 billion. So yeah. they already had taken like a $500 million write down on the value of this asset. And they said they were selling it. So it's not a shock that they're selling it here. And by the way, Sixth Street Partners is buying it or a consortium led by Sixth Street Partners is buying it. So it's going private, but it's just interesting the speed with which Solomon is making some changes at the firm. And of course, the background that we should note is that Solomon has been under pressure from some investors over his leadership of the firm and morale inside Goldman Sachs. Yeah, investors around also, some of the reports you're hearing about, about, about Solomon are rough. Um, I don't know if that's a campaign or being leaked by unhappy partners, yeah. but it's, it's been rough read. Yes, and that is important to note as well. Another stock that we're watching, or really a group of stocks, has to do with the Novo Nordisk effect. Again, the shares of that drug maker are up today as Ozempic, its drug designed to treat diabetes and weight loss, has now been found to be effective against kidney failure in an independent study. That news has sent shares of the world's biggest dialysis providers, on the other hand, tumbling. Um, Novo Nordisk, uh, which makes uh, Ozempic as well as Wagovi, and then Eli Lilly, which makes Munjaro, which is also another GLP-1. Both of those stocks have been rising. But then you have had the likes of DeVita and Baxter. Like, it's so fascinating. It's almost, <laughs> you know what it reminds me a little of? You know how there was a time where... Yeah, look at those moves. Exactly. Look at that bloodbath. Remember there was if there was a time when Amazon would say, we're thinking about maybe getting into a business or making a tiny little acquisition <laughs> in a particular area and everything would right. fall. Amazon's right. coming in. This Freak is, out. This is yeah. what this reminds me of. Like, Ozempic is like... A miracle drug, and every and it's going to take care of. We're not going to have a need for anything else. I detect else some anymore. skepticism there well, in your I tone. Mean, listen, I think. it feels doesn't it feel a little overdone, right? This was yeah. they halted the study early because it was so successful, yeah. but like people aren't taking it for this yet. It, yeah, it's absolutely true, and and even the number of people who have the prescriptions for appetite suppressant is, I think I've seen the estimates like 1%. But listen, if you're an, if you're an investor, you're looking ahead and thinking maybe it sure. goes to pill form, maybe insurance coverage, and, and the ripple effects become a lot broader. Right. If At the very least, it feels a little early for this magnitude of reaction. But, you know, <laughs> this is how markets work. We are just getting started here on Yahoo Finance Live. Coming up, the deal of the day on Wall Street. And by that, we mean Exxon acquiring Pioneer Natural Resources. We're going to get an analyst reaction straight ahead. And shifting gears as we see rising EV adoption, can the electric grid handle it? We'll get some answers. And smartphone tech, Yahoo Finance's tech reporter Dan Howley tries out the Google Pixel 8. We're going to get his review of the device. All that and more when Yahoo Finance returns.
Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu agreeing to form a national unity government with members of the opposition to lead his country in its war with Hamas. At least 1,200 Israelis have been killed, thousands more injured since Israel began airstrikes on Gaza. At least 1,000 people have been killed there, according to reports. For more on this conflict, how it evolves from here, we turn to Dan Senor, former foreign policy advisor in the George W. Bush administration and co-author of the bestseller Startup Nation and the forthcoming book, The Genius of Israel. Dan, thank you so much for joining us today. Hi, good to be with you. Wish it were under better circumstances, but uh, we are where we are. Dan, let me start here with Israeli policy, where there, there has been a big shift. For a long time, Dan, and you, you've talked about this, that Israel's policy was to contain Hamas, and now it has shifted to destroying Hamas. I'm interested, Dan, though, in what that actually looks like, tactically and strategically. And if, if Israel achieves its aims, Dan, who takes over from Hamas? Yeah, these are all great questions. The Israel for the last couple of decades has, as you said, just managed its existence, its coexistence, if you will, with Hamas. That is to say, there were military skirmishes every couple of years uh, over the uh, Israeli-Gaza border. Gaza would f send rockets over into Israel. Israel would, you know, fire back from the air. Uh, you know, there were collateral damage on both sides. Uh, but it wasn't this sort of trench terrorist warfare that Israel had to defend against, going uh, terrorists going neighborhood to neighborhood, home to home, just like slaughtering Israelis in a way that it's some some mix of 9-11 and 1930s pre-Holocaust Germany. And so Israel has decided it, it cannot live with Hamas on its on its border. So the first priority is getting rid of Hamas out of a governing role in Gaza. Second is getting rid of all the military capabilities, at least all that they can find uh, from inside Gaza. So Gaza can no longer be a launching pad for these wars against Israel. And then obviously figure out <laughs> who's going to govern Gaza going forward. Uh, but it, it's not clear. What what is clear is the status quo is unacceptable, and there's there's you know w whatever follows Hamas will not be worse than Hamas. I think there's potential opportunities for for governments in the Arab world uh, who want some stability to play a role. I think there's going to be a lot of this to be figured out, but um, but right now it's get rid of Hamas, get rid of the military capabilities, and there is no real plan right now for what will succeed it. Dan, what was your sense of Iran's role in this attack? Of course, we've seen different reports about that. And what do you think the likelihood is that Israel attacks Iran and this conflict really broadens? Well, there's no doubt Iran is involved in some way. Uh, in other words, uh, Hamas is as strong as it is because it has been getting funding from Iran. It's been getting arms from Iran going back decades. They're openly supportive of one another. Um, Gazan... Palestinians are basically pawns in Iran's war against Israel. We can debate whether or not the Palestinians have a territorial grievance uh, with Israel, certainly not Hamas and Gaza, because Israel pulled out of Gaza in 2005. But Iran's grievance? What exactly is Iran's grievance? And so the real tragedy here is Gaza and Palestinians are used, Hamas, by, uh, by the Iranians. I think that right now it is probably in Israel's best interest to avoid a multi-front war. I'm not a, a, a tactical military uh, operator, but you know the idea that Israel's got its hands full right now with beating back Hamas and Gaza is probably true, and the last thing Israel needs is a war with uh, Iran. The question is what happens in the northern border. We've seen some action today on the northern border, but it doesn't look like full-scale war uh, like we've seen on the southern border. And I think Iran is it, waiting if th to see if there's any threat against Iran before it activates Hezbollah in the north, which right now hasn't happened. And Dan, you, of course, were co-author uh, of the best uh, startup nation. I'm interested how you think this war is going to impact Israeli's economy, the business community, and, and specifically, of course, the Israeli tech community. Yeah, so Israel, this is not the first time that Israel's dealt with a major crisis. We wrote in our last book in Startup Nation how during the 1991 Gulf War, uh, there were scuds landing in Israel from Iraq. It shut down the whole country. It shut down the whole economy. And, uh, and yet Intel, for instance, which had a major innovation center in Israel at the time, uh, the facilities in Israel just kept functioning. The, the Israelis working nonstop. They still work 24 hours a day, even when they weren't supposed to be. Today, there are between four and 500 Intels, if you will, in Israel, four to 500 major multinationals that have set up operations uh, in Israel. And I just think with each crisis in Israel, 
what multinational companies that do business in Israel and, and rely on their most critical innovations it, on Israelis for have learned is that no matter what, Israelis are pretty good in crisis. And that actually is the focus of my, of my next book, which is, you mentioned, The Genius of Israel, which the subtitle is The Surprising Resilience of a divided nation in a turbulent world. When we wrote that book, we didn't anticipate, obviously, how much Israel would have to, Israelis would have to call on that resilience. But what we point out in the book is that in these crises, the Israeli capacity to come together is extraordinary, and it's like nowhere else in the world. And in that sense, it's one of the healthiest societies in the world. And that's why I think all these multinationals, one of the reasons they do business in Israel and set up shop in Israel, and why all these VCs around the world are investing in Israel, is not because there's incredible brain power and entrepreneurialism, but this is a, a fundamentally healthy society that knows how to work together and come together in a crisis. And so I don't think you'll see any change in the global innovation economies, you know, record level investing in Israel. Dan, I want to get you out of here on this question, though. Having said that, Dan, what do you think the risk is here of any kind of brain drain in Tel Aviv, meaning enough Israeli engineers, entrepreneurs, technologists think, you know what, post this war, post this conflict, um, too much, I'm moving to the U.S. or I'm moving to Europe? So I I'm pleased you're asking me these questions because this is literally what, I mean, I'm, I'm this is a subject I moved about. This is, this is the subject of our of our of our next book, uh, which which uh, it comes out in a couple of weeks. Uh, the the brain drain is what we're watching is the opposite of the brain drain, which is Israelis get frustrated with Israeli life. It's expensive. It's noisy. It's contentious. This is before the war. It's noisy. It's contentious. It's it's politically divisive. I mean, domestically, you saw this big debate in Israel over the last nine months over judicial reform, and so there is sometimes a desire for Israelis to live somewhere else. And then they live somewhere else and they realize they miss being part of Israel. They liked that they had a part of national service, that they served in the military. They felt that they were contributing to the country. They want their children to be part of this national, patriotic, public service, communal oriented country. And so even tech leaders who leave Israel, we, we, we write about in our book this magnet that keeps pulling them back, which is like the health of their communal lives, of their family lives, of their sense of being part of the national experiment, which is the state of Israel. And that sense of meaning that they derive from that, they really don't feel alone the way they feel when they live in Silicon Valley or London or Berlin, keeps bringing them back. And I would say, tragically, we are seeing that in real time right now. I'll give you an example. The reserves, Israel's put out word, they're calling on hundreds of thousands of reserves. I asked an Israeli official the other day, what's the percentage of turnout for the reserves? He said, actually, it's 150%. We, we called more reserves than we need because we didn't know, for whatever reason, there would be some drop off. We've got now more people turning up than we know what to do with. Even people who weren't called up are showing up. And so I do think Israelis, particularly in the tech community, uh, and you saw them in the middle of these judicial reform debates, getting very involved in the debate about the future of the country. And I think they, those are the same people that are turning out in massive numbers to fight in this war, to to do the reserve duty, to volunteer in a civilian role. There's a real connection to country that they feel part of, that they, they just don't get that sense of meaning and purpose elsewhere in the world. And I think that's part, that's like a comparative advantage for Israel, because I think the tech leaders in Israel feel that in Israel, where, where they, they don't feel anywhere else in the world. And I would say many of their peers around that with the world who aren't from Israel don't feel that in the countries they live in. Dan Sinor, thank you so much for your time and this insight today, Dan. We really do appreciate it. Thanks. ExxonMobil acquiring Pioneer Natural Resources. It's an all-stock deal valued at $59.5 billion. The merged companies say it could add up to 2 million barrels a day to production over the next four years. It's going to make Exxon the largest producer in America's biggest oil field. That is the Permian. Joining us now is Roger Reed. He's Wells Fargo Senior Energy Analyst. Hey, Roger, good to see you. Thanks for being here. Um, this is obviously a big, big deal for Exxon. What does this investment in the Permian tell us about Exxon's perception of oil demand going forward, what it's going to look like, where it's going to come from, and the sustainability of it? I mean, I think it tells us a couple of things. One, you know, we've obviously seen the start of the energy transition. We've seen the challenges with it, energy security rear its head, and then demand, obviously, post-COVID's come back fairly strong on a global basis. And so everybody realizes 
there's going to be an energy transition, but it's going to be a lot longer. It's going to be a lot tougher. It's going to be a lot more expensive. And uh, so if you look at that aspect of it, I think it under it, it speaks to why you would invest in oil and why Exxon would do this transaction. The other big part, and they talked about it on their call today, and they had a spotlight event on their downstream operations a couple weeks ago. And some of this is by having Pioneer, you establish no question about the ability to deliver the necessary feedstock to their chemical plants, to their refining facilities, uh, to their biofuel as we go forward. And so it, it all really hooks in well and it speaks to the value of the integrated model. Roger, why why is Exxon stock down more than four percent right now? Is that is that because some people think they pay too much? The price tag is a little too hefty. What's what's going on there, Roger? Yeah, I mean, look, I think anytime you have a company do a transaction, right? This is roughly twenty percent of the size of Exxon. You're you're going to have a little bit of an impact, right? And and whatever your expectations were for the company's growth, or in this case, you know, return of shareholder. A return of cash to shareholders, dividends, share repurchases, and so forth. So when I look at it, I just say, all right, you've changed the narrative to a, to an extent. You wouldn't be surprised the stock's down. There's also the ARB aspect of it, right? Anytime you have an all-stock deal, there's that opportunity to, to come in and they position themselves, you know, uh, long in the Pioneer side and short on the Exxon side. So that has to work its way through as well. Roger, what now amongst other um, EMP players here? Does Chevron now have to make an acquisition in the Permian? Like, what's the ripple effect? You know, it, it's always a, a challenge to say what a company absolutely has to do as opposed to, you know, what could they do, what should they do. Um, no, we don't believe that, you know, any of the other super majors, quote, have to do something. What they may do, what they see as opportunities, I mean, those will come along. I mean, uh, Chevron, for example, closed the transaction of PDC Energy, you know, just earlier this year. It, uh, the deal closed in the third quarter. So to say that Chevron somehow now has to do a deal, you're like, well, I mean, they just did a deal, right? Uh, and I think the, it, it speaks to the fact that it, Everybody focuses on M&A because this is a very large transaction, but the industry's actually been fairly active all year. This is not a, you know, a new phenomenon. It's just a very large transaction. And Roger, I'll get you out of here on this. You expect any kind of regulatory scrutiny and response here? Any kind of antitrust issues? We know, of course, President Biden, you know, he's been a critic of, of big oil and Exxon in particular. Yeah, I mean, look, it, as I said, you know, when asked before, I was like, you know, it's tough second guessing regulators. But our view is if you looked at it from a concentration standpoint, right, Exxon plus Pioneer in the Permian, but then that relative to the Permian, Permian relative to total Texas, uh, Texas relative to, you know, the, the whole nation's production, it doesn't look to us and a few people we've talked to that you're going to reach, reach any kind of concentration issues that should really trip it up from a, you know, an FTC review. Wells Fargo's Roger Reed. Roger, thank you for stopping by today. Thank you. And coming up, junk fees be gone. President Biden announcing new actions to protect your wallet from the surprise charges that is next.
Investors are growing increasingly convinced that the Fed may be done raising interest rates. Interest rate traders today are seeing only an 8.6 percent chance of a 25 basis point hike in November. And you can see how that number has come down dramatically over the past month. It comes as wholesale prices for the month of September came in hotter than expected. And we're also getting a read on consumer inflation tomorrow, of course, with CPI. Joining us now is Reese Williams, Spouting Rock Asset Management Chief Strategist. Reese, um, it's especially interesting that we got the minutes from the Fed's last meeting. They dropped today. They seem to indicate another increase. But, you know, that's from a few weeks ago now. And it seems like the perception has really changed here. So are we done? No more interest rate increases? Well, my guess is the tomorrow's CPI number is going to be pretty decent as well. So I just don't think they're going to have the ammunition to raise the rates in November. Uh, and so, yes, I, I believe we've, we've probably done, done. And I think most of the federal governors speaking that, uh, this week have kind of suggested that that could be the case as well, given the, the backup in bond yields. And Reese, the Fed's one issue, of course, and we've been talking today with, with different experts about the new geopolitical risk as well in the Middle East. I'm interested, Reese, how you're thinking about that crisis, that war. Market right now seems to think it's going to stay contained, but has that impacting your asset allocation in any way? Well, I think it, it's a risk to the market that this that this does expand. It is somehow Iran gets you know, driven in. We've known for years that that Netanyahu has not been a big fan of Iran, has not wanted Iran to be a nuclear power. You know, this could be the excuse, uh, you know, to do something about that. On the other hand, he's got his hands pretty full in, in Gaza and he's trying to run a coalition government. So I think in the short term, that and the fact that the Biden administration has clearly gone out of its way to indicate that Iran is not part of was not part of this attack or at least was not behind it uh, would suggest that that's probably off the table in the short term. In the longer term, though, I think it's going to be harder for Saudi Arabia to cut a deal uh, with with uh, Israel and in return for this uh, uh, American arms package uh, that they've, they've been hoped for. And and obviously the quid pro quo on that might be that they increase oil production in, in an election year for the Biden administration. So that was, you know, one thing that was sort of hovering over the uh, uh, over the oil markets, which which might be favorable, I guess, for oil prices over the next six to 12 months as Saudi probably doesn't help out Biden in his uh, next year's election. And so put all this together for stocks for us, um, Reese, because when you look at the bond yields now, you know, coming back a little bit back down a little bit, that is seems to have been provided a little bit of relief for stocks. Is that kind of are, are, do we have sort of a bullish setup here going into year's end? I believe we do. And, and I think the stock market has been maniacally focused on interest rates. And, you know, that's what caused the September swoon in the second half of the year. And I think the fact that bond yields have improved over the last couple of, uh, of days, that's it. That's really helped the market. So I do think it's not about profits. It's more about interest rates and the idea that if interest rates are up and to the right for forever, which is sort of how the market was feeling at the end of September, um, that that's going to be your friend uh, w when that stops. And I, and I do think that that's the case. And that's why I'm pretty enthusiastic about a, a fourth quarter rally, uh, assuming nothing goes terribly wrong in the Middle East. Reese, if, if a fourth also quarter a seasonally rally could very be strong period. If, if, so if that fourth quarter rally is in the cards, who do you think leads it? What, what companies, what sectors do you think would, would carry it? Well, the safest bet is to continue with the big cap tech trade. Um, I know they're expensive, but you know the earnings are probably going to be fine there. They have a lot of cash. They're benefiting from the high interest rates with their well, you know, money market uh, interest. Um, and and th therefore, I think the, 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 that's the safest bet. Also, if I'm wrong and the market goes back down, they'll probably outperform. Uh, and if you want a little bit of uh, beta, you can suggest some of these really beaten up groups like REITs that have been pretty bond proxy sensitive. Um, and I think they, that might be an attractive area because they have just been hammered this year. Uh, they were, got hammered last year as well. And so if people feel a little bit better about interest rates, those REITs that are exposed to some some real estate that is is not office, basically, uh, that has underlying good dynamics, you know, might be a good place for alpha in the fourth quarter. Um, and Reese, all of this said, we're also coming up on earnings season. Is that going to give another positive ca catalyst to stocks? Well, I think it's going to be I think it's going to be mixed. 
I mean, we've look what's happened with healthcare. It really hasn't been any bad earnings, um, and yet every stock that has something to do with weight loss um, or the, the possible effects of the weight loss drugs has just been destroyed in the last month. So I think that's another area completely unloved, completely beaten up. I wouldn't not buy today because every time there's a piece of good news about uh, Eli Lilly or Nova Nordisk drug, these stocks get destroyed. Um, but as I was talking to one analyst this morning, uh, these stocks are ability the healthcare space in general is sort of back to 2009 valuation levels. So it's almost like the last 10 years never happened. So I, I do think that's a, an area that's attractive and not everybody is gonna go on a weight loss drug. You look what's happened to these packaged food stocks. Um, I think we've, we've had an example now of Constellation Brands said beer sales were great. Uh, Pepsi Cola said people are still eating potato chips. And, and um, so that's an area, another area that stocks have been weak because people are worried that people are not going to eat those kind of foods anymore. And I think Americans like to eat salt and like to eat fat, and that's probably not going to change anytime soon. Yeah, mark me down in the, the salt and fat camp, Reese. Reese Williams, thank you for joining us today. If you've ever used a price comparison site and found the initial price is never what you actually pay, you are not the only one. Hidden costs are known as junk fees. And today, President Biden has announced a crackdown. Jennifer Schonenberger is in D.C. with the very latest. Jennifer. Good afternoon. President Biden unveiling new actions today in an ongoing effort to cut down on so-called junk fees or hidden fees that raise the prices for consumers on everything from internet service to hotel rooms. Look, one of the key things I've asked the council to tackle are the unfair fees known as junk fees, those hidden charges that companies sneak into your bill to make you pay more because they can, just simply because they can. Charges that are taking real money out of the pockets of American families. These junk fees can add up hundreds of dollars, weighing down family budgets, and making it harder to pay family bills. Among today's actions, the Federal Trade Commission proposing a new rule that would ban businesses from charging hidden fees and require them to show the full price up front. That would mean no more surprise resort fees at checkout or unexpected service fees to buy a live event ticket. The rule would apply to a wide swath of industries across the economy, from ticket events to hotels and apartment rentals. Also today, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau announcing new action to require large banks to provide basic information to consumers without charging fees for services like checking bank account balances or getting a payoff amount for a loan. CFPB Director Rohit Chopra also stressing banks must answer in a timely manner. Analysts saying that perhaps this means banks will have to invest in more call centers and personnel. Guys, it certainly would be nice to get someone on the phone in a bank in less than 45 minutes, wouldn't it? Yes, I think it would. Uh, you know, maybe we'll get like an AI, generative AI. There you go. In the meantime, <laughs> thanks so much. Appreciate it. Well, coming up, electrification. What will it take to get the national grid ready for a rise in electric vehicle usage? We're going to tell you next.
The UAW strike against the big three automakers may be spreading. A new strike is on the horizon. This one at defense contractor General Dynamics. Yahoo Finance's Praz Sumeranian is here with the details. Praz. Hey Josh, you know, as this big three UAW strike enters the 27th day, you know, we saw earlier this week that the UAW members at Mack Trucks uh, rejected a tentative deal and went on strike on Monday. Now, just a couple days later, uh, we hear about, I'm sorry, last night, General Dynamics, the defense contractor, saying that its, vote, its uh, members uh, voted to authorize a strike by a 97% vote to potentially go on strike if their deal uh, with, the, with the General Dynamics does, does, does expires on the 22nd of October. So they have authorized that strike. And I wonder if, if the kind of the moves by the, big, by the UAW members of Big Three has sort of emboldened these workers, you know, we'll see, but potentially another uh, UAW chapter here going on strike with um, uh, the de uh, defense contractor. But also, I want to note that GM's kind of a reprieve for GM, at least the, the, them in, in Canada, Uniform members there, the Canadian Auto Workers Union, they actually uh, struck a deal, their tentative deal with GM to sort of uh, increase base pay, uh, increase COLA uh, adjustments, and things like that. So reprieve there for GM as the sort of big three strikes happen in the U.S. You know, Pross, all, while all this is going on strike-wise, we got another interesting announcement. Samsung, SDI, and Stellantis are creating a new, planning a new EV battery plant in Indiana while all this is happening. So tell us about that and what we make of it. Yeah, it is just a lot going on right now in the world of, of the UAW and, and the big mm -hmm. three and all these other uh, plants that are associated with the UAW. But yes, uh, you know, a couple of days ago, Julie, it was Sean Fain sort of pulled back on any possible strikes on Friday, saying that they had reached an agreement with GM potentially, where GM had said they will include the joint venture battery plants with their master agreement, meaning that UAW members could unionize at these plants. That's sort of a big deal because it was a sticking point, and maybe Ford and GM have to sort of, sorry, Ford and Stellantis may have to follow suit. And just now, this morning, we hear Stellantis going to uh, put in a new second battery plant at the Kokomo, Indiana facility. Be two battery plants there, uh, about $3.2 billion in investment. 1,400 workers, but yes, you know that Sean Fain will be uh, eyeing this deal. Maybe he might mention it on Friday when he does his other update, potentially saying, hey, we're watching you guys with these battery plants. We saw GM has agreed to potentially add these battery plants to the mass agreement. Will Stellantis follow suit? We'll see. Maybe they might actually, you know, put the hurt on them potentially with more stand-up strikes. We will find out. We usually get those updates on Fridays. Thanks, Bross. Thank you. By 2030, President Biden looks to have 50% of all new vehicle sales in the U.S. be electric vehicles. As the U.S. makes that shift towards EVs, pressures mount for the nation's electric grid. With the fragmented grid already plagued by outages and severe weather, the push towards electrification may prove to be a rocky road. Here to discuss is Christine Tizak, Clearview Energy Partners Managing Director. Thank you so much for being here. This is a really interesting issue and one that hasn't gotten as much attention here. I saw one estimate that we're going to see something like a 3,000 percent increase in demands on the grid for electricity from vehicles alone. How do we even begin to cope with that? Well, we'll do it one step at a time. Um, I think that there's many, many levels in terms of how we're going to see this roll out. Um, first off, I think that one of the things we don't need to be afraid of is I do think that the grid is capable of handling the trickle chargers that are the th kind of thing that you plug your car into at home to plug it in overnight. So that's something we can definitely handle because the overall demand on the grid is low overnight. So that's good to go. The more challenging parts are going to be the use of high, um, fast, high intensity, fast paced chargers. The ones that folks who are traveling are going to need and the ones that folks who don't have off street parking or live in multifamily housing or in buildings that don't have that nearby are going to need. Those are like little industrial facilities and accommodating them on the grid is going to be a little trickier. So, and, and when I think of things that are being phased out over the same time period, in other words, if I think about like a regular gasoline station, I have no idea how much electricity a gasoline station uses. I would guess not a heck of a lot sort of compared to these new high speed charging stations that we're talking about. Right, and so what we have to do is at the utility level, the distribution utilities are gonna to have to probably harden the connections out to those stations. 
and upgrade the lines going into them. And so that is something that state regulators get involved in. And one of the challenges that we're looking at where we're in a growing inflation environment like we are right now is the ability of regulators to raise rates. Because gasoline, you know, that hits us in the pocketbook, but that's a market thing. Well, power prices are regulated in most states. And so changes in power prices can get pretty hairy politically pretty quick. Well, and what you're talking about is expensive if we're talking about grid resiliency. And, and, and Chris, Christine, let's leave aside via the EV transition for a moment. As I mentioned in the open, we already have grid resiliency issues, you know, in places like California where we have fires. We've seen PG&E uh, issues with the grid. We've seen it in Texas. So how, how if, if there's only so much ability to raise rates, how is all of this going to get paid for? Well, I think this is one of the things that's going to hold back the the transition a little bit because there is going to be this reticence to um, put new costs into people's bills. However, there are benefits with adding new infrastructure. It's going to, you know, we're going to have to have, we're going to have to invest from where we are today. What we've gotten used to is the reduction in costs associated with less expensive natural gas from the shale revolution, right? So that's great. But all of the things we're adding now are going to go up. So now we got to do strategic investing. We're going to look at how we can make these things work together. One of the reasons that politicians are interested and excited about electric vehicles is this idea of all these little batteries, which are storage, moving around. That's probably the end state. But the advantages that the advances that we're making in um, battery technology now can help provide a buffer with that interface. Uh, to the grid between a charging station and the charged cars. So you can take power at night, you can take power when we've got lots of solar during the day, and you can even use that if you're not using it to charge cars, you'll be able to maybe help stabilize a neighborhood if we're having a period of high demand. So the real key, I think, to facilitating the transportation electrification is going to be uh, the increased deployment of large battery storage over the grid, all you know, throughout the grid, at the distribution level and at the higher, you know, uh, transmission level. Um, we were just showing electricity from renewable sources um, in 2022, and I think that's an important part of the story as well, because the whole idea is if you want to move to a greener transportation source, well, the electricity has to be sourced from renewable sources as well. So we're showing the, the percentage of the overall, but it's still not the majority of power that we're getting in this country. So how close are we, you know, in that transition? Well, it depends on where you are. In some parts of the country, for example, in the Midwest, they have a lot of wind. And some days, you know, in the southeastern part of the country, well, I'd say middle southwest of the country, um, they've, in, you know, they've gone from having 86% wind on the grid at any one time. And then sometimes they drop down to a lot less than that. So it's balancing that. Wind and solar sort of balance each other out. We, wind tends to be more prolific at night. Solar tends to be more prolific during the day. The challenge from a balancing perspective is how to manage when we all get up in the morning and the wind is dying down and the solar's not on yet. And the opposite that happens in the afternoon. Again, batteries can fill that gap. It's usually a four hour window. But in the meantime, we're gonna be still using a lot of natural gas because that's the fastest response generation we have in the portfolio. And of course, we're doing seeing a lot of um, concerted effort to maintain investments in nuclear power and to bring on new nuclear power plants because of their low emissions profile and that sort of thing. So we're seeing these shifts. The challenge is, is that you can't just plug everything into the grid all at one time. Right. So there, there's limits to that. And so all of these new projects that are coming online, we've got a little bit of a backlog with all of the engineering to get that done. Yeah, really interesting stuff. Christine, thank you so much for walking us through it. Christine Tezak, appreciate it. Thanks, Julie. Coming up, the closing bell on Wall Street. We're checking in on the latest market moves and the top trending tickers. Keep it right here.
is the closing bell on Wall Street. Hormel uh, banging that closing gavel here today. A lot of focus on packaged food companies as of late, so interesting to see that. Uh, we've got all three major averages now recovering here into the close. The Dow was flirting with negative earlier. Now it's up 65 points. The S&P closing out the day up about 19 points. That's about four-tenths of 1%. And the Nasdaq up seven-tenths of 1%. As we mentioned earlier, the interest rate sensitive groups, real estate and utilities, leading gains on the day. But tech also performing well, as you can see from the Nasdaq, communication services and information technology also leading energy uh, in the red today as we see oil prices continue to flag. And let's take a look at some of the movers that we are watching into the close as well. Plug Power, those shares are popping after the company projected a sharp rise in revenue by 2027. The company expecting revenue to rise to roughly $6 billion. I find this story pretty fascinating because typically, Josh, the market is very short-term focused. Mm -hmm. Plug Power short-term forecast was not great. It actually right. is at the lower end, but the market seems to be looking longer term, which is a bit unusual. Yeah, so closer to here and now, they expect $1.2 billion in 2023. You're right, the street was closer to $1.28 billion. And then looking farther out, they give these estimates, $6 billion in revenue in 2027, 20 billion by 2030. Um, we should note, yeah, listen, nice pop here today, but this stock, Julie, has been shelled. I mean, it's down about 40% so far this year. Yeah, as you can see there, pretty volatile uh, company as well. It's a green hydrogen company, by the way, for those who are not familiar with plug power. And ChargePoint, that, is, that one's taking a different course. This one is sliding in today's trading session. The move to the downside coming after the company said it's raising $232 million via stock sales. ChargePoint noting the move aims to support its path to profitability in 2024. So read through the reports here, Julie. What, what analysts are noting is that its amendment to the $300 million in convertible notes issued in April uh, 2022, that is overshadowing that $232 million equity raise this quarter. So RBC, for example, saying the equity raise is going to provide additional comfort that the company has the, the cash liquidity to reach this cash flow uh, break-even target by the end of, of next year. But their point to their clients is the amendment in convertible notes is actually an offset. And that stock, by the way, down about 60% so far in 2023. Right, it's pretty interesting here. So basically what they're doing is, on those convertible notes, they're giving themselves more time, but they're paying higher interest, which seems to indicate relatively no demand, low demand, right? So now the modification, the amendment to those convertible notes is that the notes were due in 2027 and we're paying three and a half, five percent over 5%. Now the spread is seven to eight and a half percent due in 2028. So basically, it's getting more expensive for this company to borrow that money. Effectively yep. is what's going on amidst tightening financial and conditions. And investors not happy. No, definitely not. And then finally, we're looking at Amgen as well. That stock got upgraded to an outperform at Leering Partners. The firm citing earnings upside as well as several catalysts in the near term. And then the shares took another leg up. Right now they're up four and a half percent. Apparently the company was awaiting some data from a cancer trial and then uh, push that, the release of that back to Friday. It was supposed to be out at noon today. Yep. Michael Yi over at Jefferies, a biotech analyst who's closely watched, says that this could be a positive sign. Yes, yeah, he thinks this is, uh, this is reading the tea leaves. He thinks maybe this embargo is part of this broader press move, Julie, mm. and that the data should be decent. Writes to his clients, we are optimistic there will be multiple responses, including in Lung, which could ultimately be a blockbuster market. So we'll yeah. see if he's read the clues correctly. We'll see. He is always outspoken. <laughs> Moving on, one of the drivers of market action all week, of course, is Fed speak. San Francisco Fed President Mary Daly speaking out last night, suggesting that the neutral rate for interest rates could be higher than pre-pandemic levels. 5% is not going to be the new neutral. That I mean, there's no evidence that that will be the new neutral. That's still the policy rate trying to fight back in high inflation. But you absolutely could see the, the nominal neutral rate was 2% inflation plus 0.5 real rate, 2.5. I completely could imagine that we go from 2.5, anywhere between 2.5 and 3 as the nominal neutral in the go forward. She went on to reiterate her position that the recent surge in bond yields could have the same effect as a rate hike. And our next guest 
moderated that interview and marked the Fed's latest move to go social. Joining us now is video creator and writer Kyla Scanlon. So, Kyla, you spoke to Mary Daly, Mary Daly there. What was your big takeaway? It was a really great conversation. We talked about the housing crisis. We talked about the labor market. We talked about her views on monetary policy. And the whole goal was just to get a better grasp of what the Federal Reserve is thinking about and the trade-offs that they weigh every single day. So I thought it was a really great conversation with a lot of good takeaways. Yeah. Hey, Kyla, it's Julie here. It's good to see you. It's it's hey. so interesting to me, the sort of Federal Reserve on the one hand and then the public perception of the Federal Reserve, both from within the financial community and among sort of lay people. And one of the criticisms that the Fed gets is, well, they're not counting energy prices in their inflation calculation. They're not counting food prices. I'm just curious if, if part of the conversation, if what was your impression of Daly's acknowledgement of what normal Americans sort of are concerned about? Yeah, I mean, so I kind of asked that question, you know, how do you balance talking to markets and then explaining what people actually need to hear? And for them, you know, the whole goal is to get inflation back down to 2%. So I think for the Federal Reserve, they have a dual mandate, um, managing inflation and then managing the labor market, you know, full employment and price stability. And so I think that a lot of times when people talk about the Federal Reserve doing certain things, they're actually pointing to fiscal policy instead of monetary policy. So I think that's the thing that's really tough to remember the Fed doesn't have all the tools that are needed to fix all the problems that we do have. And Kyla, I'm interested in, I was just talking to Julie about this, our central bankers, they talk a lot. And I, you know, listen, I'm a, I'm a reporter and I'm not complaining about that. I'm sure you're not either. I love it. Keep them talking. But um, they even, of course, have, you know, listen, the Fed even launched accounts recently on Instagram and threads. What do you think of the point of that move was, Kyla, Scott? Yeah, I mean, I think it's super important. Uh, everybody's, every, not everybody's on Instagram, but a lot of people are on Instagram, the people that, you know, they're serving the public. So for them, I think it's just a way for them to tap into a larger audience. You know, not everybody tunes in to an FOMC meeting and uh, treats it like the Super Bowl, right? So I think it's just a way for them to get their message across to younger people and to make sure that everybody understands why monetary policy decisions are happening and the impact that they could have on day-to-day -day lives. So we have, you know, to Josh's point, we've been hearing from a lot of Fed speakers lately, and it seems like they are now leaning towards a pause or a skip or an ending to interest rate increases. Was that your impression from Daly and from the other Fed speak we've been hearing lately for that matter, too? Yeah, I mean, I think all of them have been like, yeah, we're probably going to pause here soon. Uh, you know, talking about long-term yields, talking about term premium, as Logan did. And then I think um, another president came out today and basically said the same thing, you know, that we're going to pause. There's been a lot of them on the docket this week speaking, and I think everybody's hinted at that idea. And it makes sense. Um, we're still trying to figure out how the economy is going to respond to all the rate hikes that they've done. You know, they moved pretty quickly, all things considered. So for them, I think it's just like we have to figure out what's going on with the economy to see if the economy does need another rate hike. Um, Kyla, one of the things I like about talking to you is you tend to have a good measure of the zeitgeist, right? You talked about, we've talked to you about the vibe session before. We talked about the Taylor Swift economy. Kind of what's on your radar right now? I know that's kind of a big general question, but like what's piquing yeah. your interest right now? What do you, what do you think is in the zeitgeist right now? Yeah, I mean, I think that there's a lot, like Taylor Swift is still a big part of the zeitgeist. I'm really uh, interested in this idea of life on beginner mode and how that's not there anymore. So the Mitsubishi, which I think I say the name wrong, but the Mitsubishi Mirage was one of the only cars that was still selling for under $20,000 and they've discontinued it. Now there's like no cars that are in that price range. Also, you know, the fall of the starter home uh, is elements of, of job stagnation, of wage stagnation for workers. And so I'm just really interested in this idea of like, where like where does the stair step begin for people who are just graduating, just getting into the labor force, and for those that are trying to progress in, in their careers? And and do we have like this quote unquote beginner mode that used to probably exist for previous generations? So like that's something I'm noodling around on, but don't quite have a thesis around it yet. It's a good question. It's a good yeah. one. Yeah. Kyla Scanlon, oh, Scanlon, thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having me.
And coming up, my conversation with one of the top tech investors in Israel. He's going to break down the impact of the war on Israel's booming tech sector. That's next. Adam Fisher is considered one of the top investors in Israel since 2007. He has managed Bessemer's Israel office, where he has invested in more than 30 Israeli startups. We spoke to Adam about the war and how he and his portfolio founders are navigating this conflict. My immediate family is fine. I'm uh, too old, as it seems, to be called up to the reserves. My children are still too young. Uh, but we have friends and colleagues um, and family members who are either... Um, have been, have been called up. And what is life? Like right now, just day to day as this conflict rages on? Well, I, I would say it operates on, on two um, incongruous planes, if you will. On the one hand, uh, a lot of things continue as, as usual. I mean, the, the country's um, not static. It's, 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 it's moving, you know, things are happening, people are working. Um, on the other hand, some things are not happening. Uh, schools are shut. Uh, people have less productive hours in the day uh, because they're very distracted, as you can imagine, uh, whether it's the uh, occasional air raid si siren uh, or uh, the trickle of more horrifying news from three or four days ago. You know, you're, you're a venture investor, Adam. It almost feels, you know, a bit uncomfortable to talk about business and, and investing as war rages, but I, I want to ask you just about the Israeli tech community. Um, it is, of course, 
a global powerhouse. How is it navigating this conflict, Adam? Well, I think foremost, the community uh, is is actually very focused on on the home front. Uh, there's tremendous unity among the Israeli tech community. Uh, we're coming together and kind of mobilizing as individuals, as companies. Uh, we're not really separate from the rest of Israeli society. Uh, we may be privileged, but we also served and served in the military and have children in the military um, and, you know, are attending funerals on an almost daily basis. Um, so we're not separate. On the other hand, we have means, uh, both in terms of time and funds, uh, to mobilize in a way that can also help the home front and actually to also help reservists who've been called up uh, with little preparation. And, and, of, I'm sorry. If you're asking more on the, I don't know if you're asking more on the business side. Mm. Uh, you know that is a unique challenge. It's not one that that is entirely foreign to us. Uh, people are called up to reserves on a regular basis, uh, not to this same extent. Um, but uh, Israelis do know how to deal uh, under difficult conditions uh, and to recover from hardships. And while there might be less productive hours. We make those those hours that we do have, they become more productive um, because uh, because we have so much to do. Um, the other thing is that, you know, Israeli high tech, as much as it's Israeli high tech, our, our markets are abroad, our customers are abroad. And I think as far as they're concerned, they would probably feel that it's business as usual. And so uh, as a venture investor, Adam, it sounds like, you, are you still able, you know, to meet with founders, to write checks, to, to meet your obligations right now and responsibilities? Well, um, I think that's more of a, a question of priorities. And mm. so that's not my priority right now. Um, and again, that is somewhat of a privilege. I don't need to find an investment every week. Um, I've, I've, I've had my share of, of deals this year. Uh, I did sign a term sheet uh, last week that I'm going to fulfill. Uh, but I'll be honest in that I, the last few days, I have not been working um, as, as many venture capitalists have not. I think we're in an enviable position where we can take a break from work and focus on fundraising for the home front uh, and in getting things done where we can through our network, uh, through our access to capital and whatever other kind of organizational skills we may have. Are you concerned, all, Adam, about any kind of brain drain after this that Israeli entrepreneurs, engineers, technologists, that some significant number of them may decide, you know what, time to pick up, move to the US, move to Europe? No, not at all. Uh, that, it's, it's never been a reason uh, to leave Israel. Uh, I, I think that Israelis feel much more unity uh, in these last few days than they have uh, for a very long time. They feel much more connected uh, to the country. Uh, you can see it in the number of Israelis who are getting on planes from the UK and Canada and the United States to come back in order to do what they can. Many of them are coming back because they received um, a draft notice, but they're doing so enthusiastically and using their own money to pay their to pay their way back. So brain drain is the least of our concerns. Uh, I have no doubt that when this is over, whether it's weeks or a month, Israeli Israel as is a country. Uh, the startup nation will rebound as if it has never happened. Um, we obviously won't forget what has happened. It, it will. It has changed. It's already changed the country. Um, but these are the types of uh, this is the type of adversity that allow the country to exist in the first place and ultimately allows it to thrive. When, when you face that and you overcome it, you emerge much stronger. And my last question, Adam, you know, there are American tech companies, obviously, with significant presence in Israel, you know, Microsoft to Apple to Intel. Any concern from you that those companies stay committed to Israel after this war? No, there as well, as long, you know, they're, they're here for the employees. Uh, 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 they, uh, as long as they're, they have good employees and have access to them. Um, they'll be happy to stay here. Those are some of the most productive employees in their organizations. Uh, the, the companies that you mentioned are very supportive of their Israeli employees, understand what they're going through, uh, the anguish, having to deal with a large percentage of people uh, drafted or just otherwise uh, distracted. Um, and, uh, and we appreciate that. No, so there's been a really an outpouring of support from the U.S. tech community, and we're very appreciative of it. 
Our thanks to Bessemer's Adam Fisher. And coming up in the market for new smartphone, Yahoo Finance's Dan Howley gives us his preview, his review of Google's Pixel 8 and 8 Pro phones on sale tomorrow. That's next. It's described as a milestone for augmented reality innovation. News today that the FDA has approved a new AR headset from a company called Senti AR. It allows physicians to see a 3D map of a patient's heart and the location of the catheter in real time. Senti AR leverages the Magic Leap 2 platform for this new tech. And here to talk more about it and the future of AR technology is Daniel Diaz of Magic Leap. Thanks so much for being here, Daniel. Um, so. Uh, what, how has this worked before? In other words, what tools have doctors had before and how different is this and how much of a leap is this for them? Sure, so Senti AR is an incredible company who's come up with this, this solution using the Magic Leap 2 platform. What they're doing is uh, completely revolutionizing the way medicine is delivered and specifically the way cardiac catheterization is done. Typically you would be a physician, you would insert the catheter into a vein and you would guide it up through the patient while looking at a 2D screen that's off to the side. And so you're navigating, basically looking at a 2D picture as you make your way to the heart. With this solution, you insert the catheter and you wear, wear the Magic Leap device and a 3D image, recreation in real time of that vessel is right in front of you. And you guide that catheter while being seeing the actual uh, vasculature of the body all the way through to the heart. It recreates the heart right in front of you and you can begin to see electrical activity. So when you perform a procedure, whether it's a cardiac ablation or you're inserting a stent into the heart, you not only see the heart and where that, that activity is happening, but you're also seeing the changes in the electrical activity of the heart in real time. It's doing things that have never been possible before. You're now seeing these images in real time and getting much more accuracy, much more safety for the patient. And safety and accuracy equals better outcomes. And Daniel, I want to just broaden out uh, the conversation here a bit because you offer the Magic Leap 2 
I think, Daniel, for about $3,300. Of course, you have competition right. now, Daniel. Apple is moving into the space with its own headset at about $3,500. Are you going to have to, there at Magic Leap, shift or think about your tactics, strategy, and price point differently going forward now that you have to compete with Tim Cook's company? Sure, I, I think it's. Um, I think the competition should be should be set on the on the right play, level of playing field here. So what Apple has done, and what Meta Quest Pro has put out, are pass through VR devices. These are devices that are essentially VR headsets that have cameras that look out into the real world. Those cameras capture your environment and then they recreate it on screens in front of your eyes. That capture of that content and then putting it into your eyes, there's a lag between that and those devices because they're essentially VR devices. Magic Leap 2 is an optical see-through AR device, which means you see your real world and that digital content is then integrated into it with zero lag. So for something like CentiR and any sort of surgical application, pass-through VR, what MetaQuest Pro is doing, what Apple Vision Pro is doing, is really not a, not a viable technology because no surgeon's going to want any lag between what's happening with their patient and what they're seeing with their own eyes. So they're actually radically different technologies. The other thing to say is Apple jumping into this game is an incredible boon for the whole industry. It begins to legitimize what all of us are doing. The fact that Apple and Meta are now attempting to go into the enterprise space, something that Magic Leap has done for years now, is really validating for what we're doing. And you know, with these sort of uh, announcements and entrants, all boats will rise. More and more developers, more and more solutions will come on board. And what's great is that people will begin to understand how these different headsets and hardware are different and which ones are really appropriate for which use cases. Magic Leap is an enterprise device for highly precise use cases. Think manufacturing, think surgery, think training soldiers and police officers. What MetaQuest Pro and Apple Vision Pro are doing are gonna be great for knowledge workers, screen replacement, gaming, entertainment. Um, but we're really talking about two different categories of AR here. Um, it feels like that VR and AR have been a very, very long time in coming in sort of gaining more mass adoption, even mass adoption in the enterprise world. Where are we now? I mean, Magic Leap itself, if, for people who have followed the history of the company, has had, to put it mildly, quite a few ups and downs. And so I'm curious kind of where the company is right now and writ large where the AR, VR development is right now as well. Sure, Magic Leap started as a consumer electronics company and we're now focused completely on the enterprise space because that is where adoption is happening. That is where these technologies can actually create real value at this moment in time is for the enterprise customer. So think about training factory workers 80% faster and being having them not only be more efficient but deliver higher quality product at the end. Think better out outcomes for medical procedures, Thinking about democratizing healthcare by getting these devices out into the world and lowering the cost of healthcare, better training for soldiers, better training for police officers, all these things have always felt like they were five years away. Everything I've described are things that there are solutions for now, that companies and municipalities are implementing now with this technology. So we've gone from a someday or you know a when question to a now proposition. And the companies who are jumping in now are really looking to gain a competitive advantage within their vertical by adopting this technology sooner, developing platforms and software for it now so that they're not playing catch up in two years time. Magic Leap's Chief Transformation Officer, Daniel Diaz, thank you so much. Thank you very much. And Google's new Pixel 8 and 8 Pro smartphones hitting the market tomorrow. And Yahoo Finance's Dan Howley had a chance to try them out. Dan, what do you think? Yeah, that's right. I have the Pixel 8 and then I have the Pixel 8 Pro. That's this bad boy here two new smartphones from Google. These are basically the company's coming out party for huge AI for commercial uh, consumer users who don't necessarily want to get on, you know, chat GPT or necessarily use Bard. And it's interesting the way they do this. So let me just break it down. This is the, the Pixel 8. This starts at 699. This is Pixel Pro. This starts at 999. They're essentially more or less around the same price uh, as your iPhones, uh, whether that's the 15 or 15 Pro line. But the difference here is that they're going very hard on generative AI. And Really what that means is when you go into the Photos app, there's going to be a bunch of different features. There's one called Magic Editor that will allow you to actually grab photos, uh, take your photos, and then grab pieces. You can see here, uh, I'm using uh, the generative AI aspect to take 
this rose and move it around. And then what it'll actually do is fill in the background where the rose was. It's all generative AI. And it's essentially filling that space in to create a something that wasn't there before. Uh, I was able to do it with uh, Reese's Pieces, but for some reason I got blocked with uh, copyright issues, I guess, uh, when I was trying to put it together, I got a notification. Uh, there's also features uh, that allow you to uh, edit your photos called best take. And so if you take a bunch of selfies, you're taking group photos and you know maybe you don't look great in one, but you look great in the other, but someone looks great uh, in that photo that you don't look great in. You can actually look at each person's face, tap in and then change them as you want. So uh, I did one with myself doing a selfie where I can go through and just kind of change up uh, my look on each one of the photos. They also have uh, the ability to have call assist, which is basically uh, you'll have uh, the Google Assistant help you when it comes to you receiving calls. So if Amazon's calling saying they have a package to deliver, you will get a notification on your phone. Uh, assist, uh, the assistant will then answer the phone for you, uh, ask what uh, the person on the other end wants. If they say they're delivering a package. Assistant will then give you canned options, little text bubbles that you can send to the person saying, leave the uh, package at the back door, at the front door, and the side door. Uh, I'm busy right now, things like that. And I tested it, it works very well. I tested it with uh, a fake delivery from my wife and then a fake dentist appointment from my wife. And I was able to confirm the appointment, uh, cancel the appointment, or reschedule the appointment. So this kind of AI is being is permeating throughout Google smartphones. I want to just point out real quick, the difference between the two is the size of the screen. The Pixel uh, 8 gets a, a 6.1 inch display. Uh, the Pixel uh, 8 Pro gets a 6.7 inch display. Uh, and the cameras are different on them. So the 8 Pro gets a 5X telephoto lens. Uh, the 8 gets a wide and ultra wide, uh, but no telephoto. And the Pro also gets, for some reason, a thermometer. Uh, there's a temperature sensor on the back. They say you're, you can use it to scan your beverage, uh, maybe the sidewalk before you let your dog out for a walk to see if it's too hot. I have no idea. They're trying to get FDA clearance to use it on folks as well, but I, yeah, that's that's there as well. Uh, so yeah, I mean, the, the phones, for, for me, for my money, these are two of the best Android smartphones you can get. Uh, I prefer to have a larger phone because I watch a lot of stuff on my uh, screen. So the, uh, the 8 Pro is, is my go-to, but Really, if you're looking for a new Pixel, a new Android phone, you want to get on, on, on the AI, then these are the two phones to go for. Well, it, it would make sense if each new iteration is that much better. That's the way it should go, ideally. It doesn't always go. It's not always worth it. But good to know in this case, it sounds like it is. Dan Halley, appreciate it. Well, new data showing that mortgage demand edged higher for 30-year fixed-rate mortgages in the last week. According to the Mortgage Bankers Association, the rate on a 30-year fix rose to 7.67 percent. But the big move in demand was for adjusted rate mortgages, which jumped by 15 percent. Joining us now is Mike Frattentoni, a Mortgage Bankers Association chief economist. Mike, thanks for being here. Um, what do you think accounted for this increased demand, not just for fixed rate, but for those ARM mortgages? Yeah, well, thanks for having me. And as you said, we really saw a difference in the volume last week where uh, overall volume was up just a bit, but we saw that large 15% increase in people applying for adjustable rate mortgages. As you noted, the fixed rate at 7.67, that's the highest we've seen in 23 years. But because of some of the moves in the treasury market, the arm rate was down to about 6.3%. So down uh, about 0.16% on the week. And people respond to price changes. Uh, it is very, very challenging to find uh, affordability in today's market, given how much rates have gone up. But one way that borrowers can adjust is by looking for an arm. And we saw in last week's data, we're up to a 9.2% arm share. That's the highest we've seen in a while. And Mike, uh, your organization sent a letter to Fed Chair Jerome Powell recently. What did you, why did you send that letter and what are you asking for? Yeah, so obviously the housing sector is one of the most interest rate sensitive sectors in the economy. And uh, we were just weighing in with the view that we think the Fed's incre uh, short uh, rate increases, getting the Fed fund rate up to between five and a quarter and five and a half, that is sufficiently restrictive to bring inflation down and we're honestly more worried now about this additional pain in the housing market given how much activity has slowed. 
Mike, on that point, uh, Peter Bukvar, chief investment officer at Bleakley Advisory Group, here's what he told his, his clients about that letter. I'd love your reaction about this. Bukvar said, while I fully understand their concerns, I don't recall these groups during the mid-2000s calling for the Fed to raise rates as they were stoking that decade's housing bubble. And I don't believe they were telling the Fed to stop QE, including the massive buying of MBS mortgage-backed securities in 2020 and 2021, and to raise rates as home prices were leaping by 40% in two years. You think Peter Bukvar has a point there? What's your reaction, Mike? Uh, I think he's a bit off base. Uh, you know, the real estate finance industry is very much reliant upon stable, uh, long-term rates. And those stable long-term rates are dependent upon the Fed doing what they do best, which is keeping inflation low while trying to maximize employment. Uh, I would uh, say he's directly wrong. Uh, actually, in 2020, we did ask the Fed to stop buying MBS uh, to the extent that they were, because uh, a lot of lenders were getting enormous margin calls based upon the swings in the market. So. Uh, our sense is, you know, we want stable rates. Uh, obviously, they can't be lower than can be sustained over time. And we need inflation to be low to keep those long-term rates as low as they can be. Well, is the stability approaching, Mike? Are we getting any closer to stability? And what do you think is a sustainable long-term rate that can still coexist with a robust housing market? Yeah. I think it's been really interesting just within the past week. You've had a number of Federal Reserve officials note that the balance of risk now really are leaning more towards concerns about weakness in the economy, that the spike in long-term rates we've seen over the last six weeks plus is really putting a lot of strains uh, into the economy. Absolutely the housing sector, but other sectors as well. In terms of where we're headed over the longer term, uh, we're going to be releasing our new forecast on Sunday at our annual convention. The Fed themselves have said that, you know, a neutral Fed funds rate is probably somewhere between two and a half and three percent. That probably means a 10 year yield around three and a half percent. And if the spread between 30 year mortgage rates and 10 year Treasury rates could get anywhere close to normal, that means a 30 year mortgage rate of, you know, call it five and a half percent. So. That's where we think we'll get to over the next couple of years. We're in just this very, very stressful point right now at 7.5% plus on a 30-year mortgage. So your outlook, Mike, for the U.S. housing market, walk me through it because supply side, limited inventory, demand side, as we're talking, I mean, affordability has been crushed. What breaks that? Does, does it just enough people, demand just simply punch through that? Enough people have, have life costs and they, they just have to pay up for it? What do you, how do you think we move out of this? Yeah. So we talked about how some borrowers are adjusting by moving to an adjustable rate mortgage. That's one dimension. You also see people able, because of maybe a hybrid work schedule, to look for properties a little bit further from their work, right? And so that's one way to bring costs down. They also might look for a condo or a townhouse instead of a detached property. So all of those ways are, are ways in which borrowers can adjust. Uh, our outlook for housing really is very much dependent on the path for rates and the path for the economy. We think the economy is likely to be in recession in the first half of next year, but a, but a fairly mild one. Uh, and sort of the net of somewhat lower rates and a somewhat weaker job market, uh, we think it'll enable some additional existing properties to be listed, which will uh, not eliminate, but make the inventory situation just a bit better. Uh, so we're looking for modest growth in home sales uh, over the next several years. Um, you know, one thing we've certainly seen is that given the very strong job market, delinquencies are extraordinarily low, actually a record low in our most recent data point. And even with some increase in unemployment, we still expect uh, the housing market is going to be strong in terms of performance of homeowners continuing to pay on their loans. Mike Frantoni, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. And coming up, we're going to go around the horn with today's top stories, including price hikes at Disney parks. That is next.
Welcome back to Yahoo Finance Live. I'm Alexandra Canal here with Josh Schaefer and Pro Super Mania. And guys, I want to chat Disney because it's going to cost you a little bit more to go to a Disney theme park. So I want to read you the announcement. It was a surprise announcement earlier this morning. Annual passes for Walt Disney World. It's going to rise between $30 and $50 depending on the pass. You also see parking going to go up by $5. And at Disneyland, we're going to see those uh, ticket prices rise anywhere from $5 to $65. So this is coming on the heels of that uh, $60 billion commitment to invest in the theme parks over the next 10 years. Disney also said it's doing other initiatives like bringing back the Park Hopper Pass, the all-day Park Hopper Pass. And if you've been to Disney recently, you know that you couldn't hop between parks until 2 p.m., mm -hmm. which if you're trying to get out there and see all the parks, 2 p.m. is very late. So they're trying to offer more flexibility, more rides. They're bringing back the Disney Dining Pass. So they're trying to say that these price hikes are coming while they're offering some new benefits to customers. I, I was at Disneyland it was the summer before the pandemic, by, I believe, 2019. Mm -hmm. I could not imagine going to Disneyland. There's only two parks, right? There's the traditional park and then there's California Adventure Park without getting the Park Hopper Pass. So you have to get the Park Hopper Pass, essentially, because you want to go to both parks. It's, mm. it's Disneyland. There's only two parks. Mm -hmm. You have to go to both parks. They're jacking that up now to get the Park Hopper Pass there, 70 bucks. So they act like you can get into these places for like $100, but then you add on the $70. I just think it's getting too expensive. It's not shocking to see attendance coming down, which I reported on mm. earlier this summer, in some of the parks. Mm -hmm. It's just too expensive. It's too expensive to go to Disneyland or Disney World right now with a family of three or a family of four. I mean, I know we, had, we saw that dip in attendance in the summer was so hot in Florida, even in California, that we, potentially that may be the reason why, but I mean, these prices are kind of extraordinary for what you're getting and, you know, enhance some enhanced benefits, but are we getting money, for, are worth it for the money? I, I mean, I have to ask for a struggling kind of, you know, mid-level family of four. This is like a few hundred bucks a day, easy, right? Plus all the, all the, the food, the parking, yeah, paying for parking, food, like yeah. you're, I'm already there. What? I mean, I it's crazy. But I know they're, they're a lot of pressure to boost that bottom line, right? Yeah, they definitely want to boost the bottom line. It's not just pressure on the park side of the business, but also the streaming side of the business. Tomorrow, actually, Thursday, they're going to be raising prices on the ad-free Disney Plus plan and the oh ad-free Hulu plan. So that's a God. plan to drive subscribers to the ad-supported tier, which is better ARPU at the end of the day. That's known as average revenue per user. So there's just a lot of battles that this company is facing from all sides. Then you have the Nelson Peltz activist investor drama from earlier this week. And Bob Iger, he's just trying to keep his head above water and trying to reset the company where it's at. Well, I know that, I know that they, I mean, last quarter, what, two and a half billion dollars in profit in the, in the theme parks? It's not like they're not making money. Mm -hmm. so the question is, can they make more money, right? Right. That we're talking about. Yeah, and, and I wonder, like, what happens to demand over time was something I was thinking about today, though. As you do rise, or you, you keep raising prices, right, there's a certain group of people that are always going to pay for that, right? You have the Disney fanatics that love it. But with the generation of streaming, I wonder what happens to some of the fans when you just have so many options to watch different shows. I think about some of the younger people in my family and what they watch and they watch different things now. It's not just like you pop on Disney and they know all the main characters and things like that. Like there's so many options for people to watch things. And I wonder how that impacts what Disney does with the parks too. It's not like everyone just sits down and watches Mickey Mouse and Goofy. Mm -hmm. You need and either new characters or some way to sort of combat the Paw Patrol thing that's happening down the street. And that's a really important point as well, because that's Disney's whole MO, right? Keeping people in the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. You create a new franchise that leads to a new character, and then that that character pops up at the park. So right. if that you know ecosystem gets disjointed, where does Disney go from here? So big question mark. Yeah, yeah, big question mark. But <laughs> we're talking about money, spending, cars maybe, parking. Uh, I don't know where it's going to go here, but anyway. We had a big Yahoo Finance Ipsos poll come out today on EVs and EV buying sentiment. And then kind of a little bit surprising sort of headline here. 57% of Americans say they are not considering a new or used EV as their next car. 31% say they are. Uh, kind of drilling down to that 50%, 57% number, which is kind of high compared to recent polls. Uh, a lot of concern there with cost, right? We're talking about, again, cost, price. We're talking about charging infrastructure, right? Another big concern for people. And then range anxiety. 
we knew we didn't, we knew these things were, ha were sort of concerns, but each of those over 70% of people has thought that, of that as a concern. So that's a big deal. And also Josh, we were talking about this before, you know, it's not that Americans aren't concerned about the in environment, they do support broadly reducing our CO2 sort of uh, expenditures or, or CO2 sort of uh, emissions, but they don't want to do it at the cost of you telling me what car I can buy. Mm. Uh, six to one percent say don't get rid of gas powered cars, don't make mandates to do that. They want to have choice, but they still want to be sort of friendly to the environment. The American consumer doesn't want to be told what to buy? <laughs> I'm shocked. No, but like, I think that's part of this story, right? Is people just do not like being told what to do and you are getting some yeah. top-down funding from the government and sort of a directive that we're gonna be an EV country and we want to go EV. And I think there are some people that are just counter to that in today's day and age. And that might be why some people are partial to just keeping their traditional car. But the cost thing is huge, right, yeah. Pross? The cost thing is absolutely huge. When you think about the fact that a lot of EVs right now, we're not at the point where a lot of these EVs are used. A lot of the EVs are new. And so you have to pay up front. Yeah. And that's an expensive cost right now to buy a new EV that a lot of times is more expensive than a traditional vehicle. Yeah, definitely the cost. Before I even read your article, Praz, my immediate thought was the infrastructure. Because I have family, friends that do have EVs, and even living East Coast tri-state area, sometimes they struggle to find a charging station. So if you go to middle America and some of these more rural areas where it's harder to find those EV charging stations, of course you're gonna have this resistance on top of the price concerns. But I do think we will eventually reach predominantly EVs. That might just well, take longer than we think. Right, and you mentioned price, a big factor. A lot of people aren't even aware, I, 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 swear, I swear, a lot of people aren't even aware of the EV tax credits. Mm -hmm. A big percentage aren't aware of That's it. That's a problem. They're not aware of the recent tax, uh, price cuts. And I was gonna ask you, I know you're looking for, potentially looking for a new car. Uh, yes, Would you get an EV if it was around $30,000? Yeah, if, if, sure, yeah, $30,000, yeah. of course. And I'm not opposed to hybrid either. If it saves me money on gas down the line, you all just have to think about that, right? Long term, that could yeah. actually save you money. Right, and, and, and we talk about people, young people wanting to get new cars, like they're not gonna buy an EV if it's $50,000, right? right? So we need to come down around 40. We had a, a Cox analyst on a couple days ago and she talked about how that was the sweet spot, $40,000. If you can get an EV down there, add in some government incentives, it's a real strong, compelling deal. Mm -hmm. All right. Allie might not be buying an EV, she might be buying an EV, but one thing we know she's always doing is going to the movies. <laughs> she's one of the few people, it seems like, still going to the movies post Barbie, maybe. We know you went out and saw that we Barbie movie, Barbie. Mm -hmm. and it was crowded. Very crowded. Well, some new research out of Apollo Global Management, our parent company, I should mention, says that movie attendance has gone down since that Barbie movie. So if you take a look at a graph out from Torsten Slock today, you can see box office coming down significantly in that purple line there in 2023, since it, that big peak was right around Barbie and Oppenheimer, and then we've seen it come down pretty precipitously. And I gotta be honest, guys, that doesn't surprise me because have you heard of another movie no. that people are going to see since the Barbenheimer craze in July. There just hasn't really been another movie to attract people no, in. No, right? I mean, of course we have the Taylor Swift movie coming out on Friday. Mm. Maybe that could boost some attendance. Sure. But if you think about last year, we had Wakanda Forever. We had the Avatar sequel. These were big, pumped up movies. And we just haven't had that this fall. Yeah, you know, um, I also saw that you shared this card spending uh, survey, B of A. Talking about how that's sort of seen that dip in the summer. Is it is it more of a seasonal thing, right? Movies pop in the summer. Obviously, Taylor Swift effect, but is it mm. more of a seasonal thing, or is it just uh, actually a Taylor Swift Beyonce an um, anomaly, right? In, in an overall consumer story, right? Yeah. We've been waiting for the consumer slowdown for all of 2023 in some ways, and we're waiting for it to come. We're waiting for it to come, but you're seeing there in the in the card data a little bit of a pickup to end the or to end the summer, I should say. But overall. We haven't quite seen the slowdown yet. Maybe movies will be one place that we start to see it outside of that Taylor Swift movie. As Ali said, mm -hmm. we got to go see it. Mm -hmm. Group trip. We're gonna no. go buy. We got to go buy tickets online. Yeah. That's our new focus right now. We'll go do that. We're gonna have more markets coverage on the other side for you. This is Yahoo Finance. Live.
We're watching shares of Microsoft edging lower after hours here, company revealing in a securities filing that the IRS says the tech giant owes $29 billion in back taxes. Not much of a surprise here, but Microsoft saying it does not agree and will contest this adjustment. Microsoft says the process could take years and quote, we believe we have always followed the IRS's rules and paid the taxes we owe in the U.S. and around the world, Julie. And indeed, this seems to have to do with different jurisdictions. Um, and this occurred during the years, the IRS is from 2004 to 2013. So according to a post by a Microsoft vice president who deals with tax issues, this the structure of the company has changed. So this wouldn't apply anymore. But obviously, the company pushing back $29 billion, even for Microsoft, which is an <laughs> enormous company, is a lot of money. That's Yeah, that's with a B. He, uh, this, the, so Daniel Goff, Microsoft's VP, goes on to say, we welcome the IRS's conclusions of its audit phase, which will provide us with the opportunity to work through these issues at IRS appeals. So the so fight continues. We'll see yeah. what happens. All right, it is closing time here at Yahoo Finance. Here's a look at some of the top stories of the day. A rough IPO for Birkenstock. Shares of the footwear company sliding in their first day of trading, down than more than down more than 12% on the day. The stock opened at $41 a share. That was below the $46 IPO price. The action showing investor caution around IPOs, and maybe this one in particular. It follows declines in other newly public companies, including Arm Holdings and Instacart. Congressman Steve Scalise officially the nominee to be House Speaker, but it's not a done deal yet. He's now working to shore up support among Republicans before the full vote on the House floor. And more price hikes are coming to Chipotle once again. After a pause of over a year, the company says inflation is to blame for this round of increases. The company is not saying how much prices will rise this time around. And time now for what to watch Thursday, a new inflation print for the Consumer Price Index, the data for the month of September to provide the latest read on consumer prices. The number the Fed we know will be keeping a close eye on as the central bank remains committed to bringing down inflation. And sticking with the Federal Reserve, Boston Fed President Collins is expected to speak Thursday afternoon. Remarks from Collins will come as Fed officials see restrictive policies staying in place until inflation eases. And on the earnings front, expect the latest quarterly report results from Delta Airlines, Walgreens, and Domino's. All companies set to report their earnings before the opening bell. And lastly, on the heels of the CPI report, the Social Security Administration to release its 2024 cost of living adjustment. So approximately 70 million retirees receiving Social Security checks will find out the increase to their monthly payments. The increase this year expected to be much smaller than last year as inflation has come down. Well, that'll do it for today's Yahoo Finance Live. Um, very interesting day, especially with the Birkenstock IPO. Mm. Really, yes, it has been a weak market for IPOs recently, but this one really stands out in terms of the action that we saw in this offering because of being, I mean, the other IPOs fell on their first day but none of them was priced below the range in this fashion. And as our Jared Blakery pointed out, none of them took as long to open up. So obviously there was a lot of haggling behind the scenes. Yeah, I mean, this is, listen, we, we have had Arm and Instacart and Clavio, but Birkenstock is a different kind of kind of company, a big, well-known brand. I did think it was interesting to talk to some guests about where the LVMH results, which we know disappointed right. some on the street, whether that could have weighed on appetite a bit. Maybe so. We'll All see. right. That does it for us. We'll be back here tomorrow at 3 p.m. Eastern. Uh, we'll see you then. <laughs>